So, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to talk about the future international system of units, which will be linked to fundamental constants in order to fundamentally improve the SI, the international system, for the benefit of industry and global trade, for society and science and research. And by that, we create the future uh, by enabling ultra-precise measurements. Now, in my talk, I would like to briefly remind you on the present international system and highlight some of the deficits. Uh, I will come then to the revised SI, which is sometimes also called the quantum SI, uh, and with that, we create the future, for instance, also by underpinning what is sometimes called uh, <coughs> the second quantum revolution. So the International System of Units, the SI, was established basically in 1960 by the General Conference of the Meter Convention. Uh, it consists of the base quantities, the length, mass, time, electric current, temperature, amount of substance, and luminous intensity and the according units, like the meter, the kilogram, the second, the ampere, and so on. So exactly 50 years ago, the second, the unit of time, was redefined using an innovative, very far-reaching concept, namely by fixing the numerical value of a constant of nature, namely the hyperfine transition frequency of the cesium-133 atom to be exactly 9,192,631,770 oscillations of a little pendulum in an atom. And this was early on proposed by James Clark Maxwell in 1870 already, where he said, that one should use the properties of molecules and atoms uh, to define units and not those of the Earth, because those are too unreliable. Now, this concept uh, was, as I said, very, very far-reaching. When the second was redefined, we could realize the second with an uncertainty of 10 to the minus 14. Nowadays, we have improved that by a factor of 100 by using atomic fountains. We can realize the second with uh, an uncertainty of 10 to minus 16. Uh, so we improved ourselves by two orders of magnitude without changing the definition. And this is the far-reaching concept behind it. And this we applied as well also for the meter by fixing the numerical value of another constant of nature, I would say, namely the speed of light. Uh, and this was a suggestion early on by 19, in 1900 by Max Planck, and we'll come to that later, uh, by fixing the numerical value of the speed of light to be exactly 299,792,458 meter per second. Again, very far-reaching concept. Nowadays, we can measure very, very small distances from the micrometer to the nanometer and even picometer regime up to very large distances, uh, like in the lunar, re uh, um, lunar ranging project, where we measure the distance from here to the moon with an uncertainty of a few centimeters. And this uncertainty is only limited by our technical ability. It's not limited uh, by any definition. And as you might have heard, uh, very recently, gravitational waves have been uh, detected with an uncertainty, a relative uncertainty, below 10 to the minus 20 uh, meter. So you can see that this definition opens all possibilities which we finally can realize te uh, technologically. Now, this is very different for the mass, for the kilogram, where we still have an artifact sitting in Paris, essentially since 1875. Uh, and this artifact uh, has uh, only three times in its life been compared to, their, to its own uh, official copies, as well as to the national uh, copies, which we have at different institute, national metrology institutes around the world. And this is shown here in this graph. So uh, by definition, the kilogram is always, the international prototype is always a kilogram. So this is just a definition. But then you can see that uh, in these three campaigns, the <clears throat> national laboratory uh, prototypes, the red ones or the official copies, uh, the, the blue ones, deviate uh, from the original kilogram. So they always have to be re readjusted. 
so we don't know what's going on. So we can also not say whether possibly also the mass of the IPK might drift. It will drift for sure, but we have no idea uh, whether how much it is. And so this is certainly an unsatisfactory situation. And as compared to what I said before, we can never be better than this artifact. So we can never realize the kilogram better than the properties of the artifact. And so this is limiting innovation, and this is why we have to do something. Now, it's even worse because the mass, the kilogram, enters into the definition of the luminous intensity. So there we have the, um, the watt, and in the watt we have the kilogram. It directly enters in the um, definition of the amount of substance of the mole, because this is 12 gram of carbon, or the entities which are in 12 gram of carbon. And it enters in the old definition of the ampere, of the electric current, for the electric current, uh, which was defined by the force between two infinitely long conductors, which have an infinitely small diameter, which is actually hard to realize. But the force, in the force, we have the kilogram as well. Now, um, by the demands of our stakeholders and by the improved technology, this has to be, had to be changed in the 1990, uh, exactly in, in 1990 by fixing, actually, the numerical value of ratios of fundamental constants, namely the Planck constant and the electron charge. And by that, you get the von Klitzing constant uh, for, for, for resistance and the Josephson constant uh, for the voltage. And this, these ratios have been fixed in 1990 in order just to, uh, to comply with uh, the uh, technological um, um, advances. Now this, at the same time, made uh, the definition of the ampere isolated. It's not connected to the other quantities now in the, in, in the SI, uh, and it's living in its own quantum world. At the same time, however, this definition has triggered a revolution. Uh, and I would like to show that here on the basis of the realization of the ohm, of the resistance, as compared to a reference value. And what you see here, the different lines are just realizations of different uh, NMIs, of different national metrology institutes, in, uh, yeah, deviations, in deviations in, in terms of micro-ohm. So you can see, for instance, uh, the realization by the National Bureau of Standards, which nowadays is a NIST, the NMI in, uh, in the US, or the PDB, uh, the National Metrology Institute in Germany. And you see there is a large deviation from the realization of these different, uh, of these different, uh, different NMIs. Now, with the advent of the uh, quantum Hall effect, uh, you see that the situation uh, improved tremendously, immediately, actually. The quantum Hall effect today can be realized with a very small uncertainty, which you can see on the second, the third bar. And finally, we have a reproducibility in the order of 10 to the minus 9, which is excellent as compared to what we had before. Uh, this you can easily see. And one can therefore really say that the quantum Hall effect has revolutionized electrical metrology with tremendous effects for innovation in industry. Here, for instance, you see a high-tech uh, clean room where you prepare all these uh, integrated circuits. Uh, we have advanced manufacturing uh, devices. We have uh, arbitrary waveform analyzers based on this Josephson effect, quantum Hall effects, and we have ultra-low current amplifiers, a lot of technology that has been developed since the 1990 to realize the units. So this has been a tremendous technology, uh, te technology boost, which we have seen over the years. Now, nevertheless, uh, the ampere in the present system is isolated, and it's based on quantum effects. And as well isolated is the temperature, the Kelvin, because it's defined on the basis of a material property, namely the triple point of water and the zero point, so to say. So we have only two points in the whole scale to, to realize uh, the unit, and we have to extrapolate and interpolate in between, which is also difficult. So nevertheless, it's also completely isolated from the rest uh, of, the, of the SI. So finally, all together, we can say that we have a non-ideal situation for five out of the seven base quantities. And at the same time, I've been showing to you that we have seen the tremendous benefits of quantum-based units as for the length, as for the time, and very recently for the electric current. So the question is, 
can we build a coherent and consistent set of units which are based on quantum effects? Uh, and this is exactly what we would like to do. And this brings me to the second part of my talk, namely the revised SI, uh, which is based on quantum effects in order to create the future. Now, just to remind you, quantum mechanics was actually discovered at the Metrology Institute in 1900 uh, at the PDB predecessor institution, the Reichsanstalt. Measurements were taken in this building, actually, on the black body radiation. So black body radiation is uh, very simple, basically. You take a box, a black box, you have it at a certain temperature T, and you have a little hole in this box, and you investigate the radiation which is coming out of this box, the wavelengths and the intensity as a function of the temperature. And these are the original data here. So, what you, so there's intensity plotted versus uh, the, um, the wavelengths. And if you are at low temperatures, you have relatively large wavelengths, so red colors, so to say, as in your, on your oven, and uh, relatively low intensities. If you increase the temperature, T, uh, then you get high intensities, and it goes to shorter wavelengths. So the color gets brighter and brighter, goes into blue and so on, as everybody knows from, uh, from the kitchen at home, essentially. Now, these uh, metrologists at those time, Otto Lummer, for instance, at the PTR, uh, did these measurements extremely exactly. At very, low, uh, at very long wavelengths, they saw that there was a discrepancy to the, as compared to the theor theoretical predictions which they had at those times, namely the Wien's law, and they were confused about that. So in the night, they were calling Max Planck. Max Planck was in the curatorium of the Reichsanstalt at those times, and Max Planck overnight, as he said, um, in an act of dispersion, he, he, wanted, he, he had to quantize the radiation energy. And this led to his very a famous formula on the radiation law, and here is the quantized energy of radiation, essentially of light, as you wish. So what started, what, as one could say, as very esoteric metrology. So people looked at a very specific effect, black body radiation. Nobody in industry was ever interested in that. And they looked at a yeah, small, small part of the wavelength spectrum, and they, they find a tiny difference. That's what they did. And out of that then emerged quantum mechanics, and quantum mechanics today underpins more than 60% of the world economy. So you can see that basic impact, uh, basic uh, metrology can create a huge impact finally, which is very important also for our anticipation today. Now, uh, Max Planck was even more visionary. At the end of his paper, where he described this effect, and we explained also the quantization of energy. Uh, he said, and this paper was in German and I translated it for you in English. Um, he, he said, with the help of fundamental constants, and among them was his Planck constant, which he just discovered, and he didn't name it like Planck constant. With the help of fundamental constants, we have the possibility of establishing units of length, time, mass, and temperature which necessarily retain the validity for all times and civilizations, even extraterrestrial and non-human. And this is exactly the vision which we would like now to realize in the revised SI. And this is shown here in an infographic. So we fix the numerical values of defining constants, among them fundamental constants of nature. This is this inner circle. And then we apply the equations of physics in order to realize the units, among them also the base units, which are on this outer circle. And this then, because we are convinced that these fundamental constants are not changing, uh, this would be then for all times and civilization, even uh, throughout the universe and even extraterrestrial um, civilizations. And this, again, is very much in the spirit of the French Revolution, when the Meter Convention was created, uh, namely, they said, a tout le temps, a tout le peuple. So this is exactly what we are doing now on a very ultimate level, I would say. Now, how does it work? Um, we have a consistent set and a coherent set of fundamental constants based on our present knowledge of, uh, of nature. 
and out of those we create the units. Now, uh, what are the properties? So this is a fundamentally improved concept uh, because of several reasons. First of all, it guarantees long time stability. So by just fixing the numerical values of these fundamental constants or defining constants, nothing can be changed. It cannot fall down and so on and so forth, like the kilogram, it will not change. It guarantees long time uh, stability. Um, you have to understand that it is usually always a set of these defining constants uh, that establish a unit in general. So you need some of these basic uh, constants, uh, fit them into, uh, into um, equations in order to realize, for instance, the Kelvin, you need delta nu, you need the Planck constant, and you need the Boltzmann constant for realizing the Candela. You need delta nu, the Blanc constant, and the luminous efficacy. And for the kilogram, you need those three here, namely, again, delta nu, the frequency, uh, the speed of light, and uh, the Blanc constant. Now, since you have different equations in physics relating the fundamental constants to the units, you have different realizations. For instance, for macroscopic masses, the kilogram, we have two realizations presently, and one is a so-called silicon crystal method, and the other one is the so-called watt balance or Kibble balance. Uh, just explain the watt balance. As you can see here from this little picture, it's really a balance. So here is a bar, and on the one side you have a kilogram, so, uh, and there you have the gravitational force, and on the other side you compensate this gravitational force with an electric force. And in the electric force, you realize the uh, current, finally, by the Josephson and the quantum Hall effect. And there, you get the connection to the Planck constant, as I said it before. So let me say a little bit more about this silicon crystal method. And uh, by that, I can explain to you a little bit better how, how this connects. Um, so what you do here is you have a crystal sphere of silicon, of enriched silicon, 28. Uh, and what you do is, in a large international collaboration, as you can see here, of, of different metrology institutions, you count the number of atoms in this crystal sphere. So we reduce a macroscopic mass to the quantum nature, to microscopic properties, namely the mass of atoms. Now here's a formula which looks maybe a little bit difficult, uh, but uh, it's easy to understand, I think. And I would like to explain it. And what you see is that the mass is directly related to the Planck constant here. Now, if you look on this formula, the first part is nothing more than just the number of atoms. Uh, because up there is the volume of the sphere, so you have the volume. And then uh, the A is a lattice constant. Uh, and if you take a, a cubed, you have a unit cell of the crystal in the, in the, in the uh, silicon sphere. And then we know that per unit cell, there is eight atoms. So, we know the size of the unit sphere, we know that there is eight atoms in there, we know the entire volume, and dividing the entire volume by the unit sphere and multiplying by the eight atoms, we get the number of atoms. So by that, by these two measurements, volume and unit lengths, uh, we get the number of atoms. Now the second part looks a little bit difficult, so we have now the number of atoms, but we don't have the mass of the atoms. So we need a mass scale. And this mass scale now uh, is provided by this second uh, term, which comes out of very basic quantum theory of the hydrogen atom, as you learn it in your third semester in physics, for instance. Um, so what, what, is, what is here is just the mass of the electron. And this mass of the electron is given by the Planck constant, the speed of light, and both of them in the new system will be fixed the, or the numerical values will be fixed. And there are, then are, there are two other quantities, namely the Rydberg constant, uh, or let me start first with the alpha, with the fine uh, structure constant, uh, which we can measure to a very high precision, 10 to minus 10, and the Rydberg constant R as well, with a precision even better, 5.9 5 times 10 to minus 12. So these two numbers we know exactly. Or, or very well, so the mass of the electron is known on the level of 10 to minus 10. Now we have the number of atoms, we have the mass of the electron, and now we have to relate the mass of the electron to the mass of the atoms in our sphere. And this is taken care by this last term here, 
uh, where we just measure the relative masses of our silicon atoms uh, in the sphere as uh, compared to the electron mass. And this is how we then, in the future, can realize the kilogram. So this is a primary realization of the kilogram for the future. Now we need to do a lot of very high-level measurements to uh, do that with, a, with high precision. For instance, what you see here is um, a spherical interferometer where we measure the diameter and finally get the volume of the sphere. So we measure some 100,000 diameters uh, and, uh, and model the surface of the sphere with uh, spherical harmonics, some, yeah, again, hundred thousands, and finally we get the volume of the sphere. So this is now the most advanced length in the parameters which we need in order to get this precision which we need for realizing the kilogram. Uh, we need the most advanced surface technology because we have to make sure that the surface is well known so there shouldn't be any other layers of atom and so on. No fingerprint, which is a microgram or so. So all of that uh, has to be avoided. So we have to be very, 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 very clean and we need uh, advanced surface technologies. And we actually also do the most precise measurement in chemistry in this realization. Namely, we need to know exactly uh, the, uh, the um, molar mass and the contribution of the silicon 28, which we measure uh, with, an, uh, with an uncertainty in the order of 10 to minus 9. So this is the most uh, precise measurement in chemistry. So there are a lot of innovation on this side, but there's also a lot of innovation on the side of the Kibble balances or the vac balances, the other possibility how to realize the kilogram in the future. And this shows you now how this really goes into the future. Um, at, in the German Metrology Institute at PDB, we have a project, and others have as well, uh, we have a project where we built together with industry and business associations, we built a watt balance, a commercial watt balance, and with this commercial watt balance, then you can realize the kilogram in your laboratory. You don't need to go to Paris anymore to us to, to really uh, get the kilogram, but you can realize it in your laboratory, and we are aiming at, as you can see here, to very high accuracies in the order of uh, 1.7 times 10 to minus 7, uh, which um, end. Uh, we can realize then this, this balance uh, you can use for masses between one milligram and one kilogram. So we can directly realize now the, the, a large part of the scale, not only the kilogram as we had it before. So in addition, uh, this balance would be self-calibrating. Uh, you just have to compare, make sure that you have no measurement uh, uncertain or no, no other errors of measurement. Uh, it will be a high precision realization. Uh, it will be applicable for industrial applica applications according to OEML um, regulations E1 and E2. Uh, we use off-the-shell comp components, and the whole thing can be connected to the Internet of Things. So this goes directly uh, into what we call uh, Industry 4.0 or digitalization. So you see there's a lot of possibilities now with this new system for innovation. So we have different realizations. Uh, we can do key comparisons between the different realizations, dif different uh, NMIs. So the whole thing becomes much more robust. It becomes safer. There's less, less correlation. It's not like that, that we only have one kilogram at, uh, at, 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 the, um, at the BIPM in Paris. Now, there's one other properties even, property even which I would like to um, tell you. And this is that we now can even, for the very first time, realize atomic masses, very, very small masses, by different, by different equations now of physics. For instance, uh, one is the so-called atomic recoil effect. It's very simple. So what you do is you come with a photon on a single atom. A single photon hits a single atom. The single photon is absorbed. And this single photon had a momentum before. And this momentum goes to the, to the atom. So this atom recoils a little bit because a photon was hit by a photon. Now, and momentum conservation tells us that the momentum of the photon is equal to the momentum of the atom. And uh, we know the momentum of the photon because this is given by H bar K, the Planck constant, times uh, its uh, wave number. We know the wave number exactly. The Planck constant is fixed. So we know the, f the, the, uh, the, the momentum of the photon very well. And the momentum of the atom is just the mass of the atom times its velocity. And the velocity change can be measured by interferometric uh, measures extremely well. 
So finally, the mass of the atom is given by this equation. The right-hand side, we have either defined fixed the numerical value of the Planck constant, or we can measure very precisely. So for the very first time, we can realize now atomic masses in the SI, which we couldn't do before. So we can cover a large part of the scale now by individual realizations. And here you can also see that we can use different equations of physics to realize the unit, very different equations. Um, and so we are getting uh, utmost flexibility. We can realize everywhere in the world and even in the universe, uh, because these experiments, as far as we know, the physics equ equations which we use here are valid throughout the universe, maybe not in the black hole and maybe not very at the end of the universe, but at least the known universe. Uh, so we can realize uh, these units everywhere. And um, as I said, throughout the entire scale, which is very important also for the Kelvin, for instance. You remember in the present SI, we have only two fixed points and we have to interpolate and extrapolate, which is partly very difficult. But now, based on this equation, namely uh, that the um, energy of a system is connected to its temperature via the Boltzmann constant K in between. And as you all know, this is uh, for one degree of freedom. If you have more, you have more of these uh, contributions. Nevertheless, this is a basic equation. And by using that, we can now realize by uh, different methods, again, the new Kelvin. And there are very different methods like acoustic gas thermometry, dielectric constant uh, gas thermometry, Doppler, noise, radiation uh, thermometry, and all are relying on different equations. But all need the Boltzmann constant and if you use and if you fix the number of the Bolts, the numerical value of the Boltzmann constant, you can use all these equations in order to um, realize the temperature now throughout the entire scale. And here is an example. So here is the temperature in Kelvin from 250 to about 1,000 or so. And, and here you see these different methods now in the new system, who, who, which cover part of the scale. And by using all of them, we can just cover the entire scale and get primary realizations at every point, not at only at fixed points or at two points, essentially. Uh, and again, there's a lot of innovation. So uh, colleagues at uh, NIST and also at uh, NIM in China, they brought a new method to perfection, I would say, up to now, and maybe it's uh, in the future even more improved, uh, which is called noise thermometry. So what you do there is, what you can see on the left-hand side, you have a resistor at a certain temperature, and uh, in a, at a certain temperature, you have a certain noise, electronic noise, which is going up if the temperature is higher, and uh, which is lower if the temperature is lower. And on the lower side, UREF, you, you generate quantum noise. <laughs> By, via the Josephson effect and quantum Hall effect, you, you generate quantum noise and you compare it, and then you get this equation, which is indicated here. And again, you see the Boltzmann constant. Uh, if this one is fixed, all the other things you measure, you get from this quantum noise, you get the temperature. So this is a completely new kind of thermometer, which we think at PDB and others as well at, uh, in China and, and, and other NMIs uh, in the future, uh, can help us realizing the um, Kelvin with a very low uncertainty on the millikelvin level, as you can see here on the left-hand side of the scale, over the entire temperature regime. So completely new, entirely new uh, possibilities. So obviously this triggers innovation. So even companies are interested in having such a thermometer uh, because they don't need to come to us and calibrate and so on. Um, and uh, so we have a project and others as well, uh, where we try to commercialize these new uh, innovative uh, thermometers in the future. So, as I have been indicated at very different instances now, is that the new system triggers innovation in research and industry. There's another consequence not everybody is used to. Uh, obviously, the base units are only a convention. Uh, this is um, history of how the uh, present SI evolved. So we have the base units, but now with the new system, it's only a convention. You can easily see that uh, in the case of the ampere. For instance, you can use the electric charge and the time 
So you can measure how many charges per time went through my uh, conductor, and then you get the current, the ampere. So this is one possibility, but, but you can, could also directly realize the Coulomb, the charge, by just counting electrons. Uh, so you would only need one of our, um, of our um, defining constants. And on the other hand, you can also directly realize the ohm and the von Klitzing uh, constant, the volt, by using ratios of two constants, the Planck constant and the electric charge. So we have many, many, many possibilities in the future realizing the units, not only the base units, all of the others. So one of the big steps forwards is, in addition, that now the electric units, which were living in their own quantum world somewhere isolated, are now back in the SI because the whole entire SI is now a quantum SI. So this is a huge step forward. So all this system now is coherent and compact. So it's connected by the equations of physics. All of those go uh, together. We can do consistency checks because as I have shown to you, for instance, with a kilogram, we have two completely different ways, the Kippel balance and the silicon sphere, uh, to realize the kilogram. And if they come to the same value, uh, then we, at the same time, prove that the equations, the underlying equations, are correct. So we have consistency checks also of the equations, uh, which we do here. And there are other possibilities, like having Ohm's law on a quantum level, which is sometimes also called quantum meteorological triangle. Uh, as I have been showing to you many times now, uh, whenever you have a better experiment, if you improve your technology, you can come to a better realization without changing the definition. One example for the, for the future SI would be that uh, we can count single electrons, as you can see here in these uh, this chips here, uh, with certain uh, electrodes. We can have a situation that, as indicated left, uh, that we have single electrons tunneling into a well and being pushed out again by changing the height of the well. And by that, we can get a current of individual electrons. And if we count the electrons, and we, if we know the time, we can realize the ampere. And we can do that with very high precision. Uh, we have single electron detectors, uh, and we can do that with a precision of 10 to minus 7, 2 times 10 to minus 7 presently. And in the new SI, this realization would be the best realization for small currents, which we all of, often use in this dosimetry and uh, in other practical applications. Now, and also, this again is uh, opening the door to innovation, because uh, this might be seen as a first step towards quantum electronics. Usually you have noise, because you never, in a, in a usual current, you never know when your electrons is arriving, if you have many, many of those. But if you now in, imagine or envision that we would have a source which is providing the electrons on demand, <laughs> then you don't have this shot noise anymore, uh, so you can build a completely new electronics. Again, innovation for the future. Okay, so altogether, I think I convinced you that this is a huge change at the same time, it's very important that there is no change felt by our stakeholders, by the users, um, by yeah, uh, somebody going to the supermarket and buying uh, a kilogram of apples, say. So there should be no change. And in order to do that, we have to ensure that the system is uh, continuous, that it is harmonized, and that it is stable. And uh, this we do by establishing the numerical values of this defining constant in the present system with an accuracy that is much better than we need for future realizations. And this is what the national metrology institutions did uh, the last 20 years, as, and even more, as you all know. Now, what is the status? If you look for the electron charge, this is known on the level of 5 times 10 to minus 9, uh, the latest code data value from 2017, uh, and this is fine. This is good enough for all practical applications. The Boltzmann constant, uh, there was some difficulties, uh, but very recently now, this is a situation as we had it on 1st July of uh, this year, of uh, 2017. The 1st July of 2017 was a so-called closing date for all experiments measuring this defining constants, uh, because then at some date we have to fix the numerical value. 
and the 1st of July was the closing date where all uh, experiments who wanted to contribute to this fixed numerical value had to be published. Okay, and this is the situation shortly after the 1st of July 2017 for the Boltzmann constant. And as you can see, all these different measurements uh, look very good. And this is the average value. So all of these measurements are consistent. So they overlap within their uncertainty. And we have uh, essentially three independent methods. As you can see here, we have HGT, acoustic gas thermometry. We have DCGT, uh, dielectric gas thermometry. And we have even uh, the uh, Joseph noise thermometry. Uh, so we have three different methods. And the requirement set by the consultative committee for temperature was that we have at least two different methods. So we have three now. And, uh, all of these different methods should have an uh, accuracy below 3 times 10 to the minus 6. And the blue bar, which you can see here, indicates 3 times 10 to the minus 6. So all of them are obviously better. So we have uh, fulfilled the requirements of the, uh, of the uh, CCT, of the Consultative Committee for Temperature. Uh, the uncertainty in the Boltzmann constant is 3.7. Uh, 3.7 times 10 to minus 7, as uh, set down in, uh, as, as uh, written in Code Data 2017, and this is fine. This is uh, this accuracy is uh, is very good and good enough for all applications. Now we come to the Planck constant and the Avogadro constant. This was the most difficult one, and here you see that the Planck and Avogadro constant are connected via this equation down here, and the right hand side we have the fine structure constant alpha, we have the relative mass of the electron, the molar mass of the electron, Me, we have the speed of light and the Rydberg constant, and uh, I've shown them to you before. So this right-hand part we know very, very well. We actually know it on a level of 4.5 times 10 to minus 10. So the product of these two, of the Avogadro constant and the Planck constant is uh, 4.5 times 10 to minus 10, uncertain only. So this means that whenever we measure one or the other, the Planck constant or the Avogadro constant, we know uh, the, uh, the other one uh, with this uncertainty, at least. Now, so experiments determining the Planck constant automatically also determine the Boltzmann constant and vice versa with an uncertainty of 4 times 10 to minus 7. Uh, 10 to minus 10, sorry. So this is a situation which we had uh, shortly after the 1st of July in 2017. Uh, here you have the average value, and then you can see that the data are not consistent. So they don't overlap within their uh, given uncertainties, and this is a problem because the CCM, the Consultative Committee for Mass, required that the data should be consistent. Now, CoData, assumes that the experimentalists were too ambitious with their uncertainties, so they just expand the uncertainties by a factor of 1.7, and by doing so, the data set becomes consistent. There were other requirements from CCM, from the Consultative uh, Committee of Mass, namely that uh, at least two or one of the experiments should have a un relative uncertainty of below 10 to 2 times 10 to minus 8, and now we see, still with this expansion factor, we have two experiments, which are below 2 times 10 to minus 8. And there was another um, requirement, namely that there are at least two other experiments which have an uncertainty below 5 times 10 to minus 8, and now we have even five of them, even with the expansion factor. Um, and we have two different methods, namely the silicon crystal method and the Kibble balance method. So all requirements which were set by the CCM, by the Consultative uh, Committee of Mass, were fulfilled, are, are fulfilled now. Uh, and this is why the CCM recommended that we should go on with the re redefinition in 2018. Now, in the, uh, this was then discussed in the Consultative Committee for Units, the CCU. Uh, and there, we also discussed the demand of the stakeholders. So here again, you see the data set, and now you see uh, the OEML recommendation for E1, what is called E1 weights, uh, and there you need an uncertainty of 8.3 times 10 to minus 8. This is what calibration laboratories really need, and this is this uh, pink bar, which you can see here, and you see it's a quite small uncertainty, and it's relatively close to what has been measured to the uncertainties. 
And this was discussed very heavily in order for the National Metrology Institutes to calibrate E1 laboratories, you need even to be better, you need an uncertainty in the order of three times 10 to the minus eight, and this is this red, red bar. And then you see now it's getting difficult with the measurements. Uh, and the way out uh, could be that we don't use the individual measurements to realize the kilogram, but we create a consensus value out of the different measurements, which could be the mean value of those. And the present mean value, this is the, uh, the little bar in the middle of the game. This is obviously very good in the order of 10 microgram only and would be sufficient for calibrating E1 um, um, weights and, um, and laboratories. So realization based on a consensus value was suggested. And as you can see, this is fine. That uh, ensures harmonization and stabilization uh, for the kilogram as it is realized in the future. Uh, in the CCU meeting, we had all the other CCs, other consultative committees for temperature, for chemistry, for electric quantities, for radiation quantities, and all of them agreed uh, and proposed that we should go ahead and that we should uh, go for a redefinition. And this was also underlined by some uh, transparencies by Stefan Schlamminger from NIST. Uh, the upper one here shows the evolution of the measurements for the Planck constant over the years. And what is plotted is the third best, the second best, and the best value. And you see, uh, first of all, they come closer together and they're getting better and better. So since 2005, the situation has improved by about one order of magnitude. And if you look on the maximum differences between the highest value and the lowest value in these realizations, then you also see we had an improvement by at least a factor of 10 over the years. So there has been tremendous improvements over the year, and we can also expect that we further improve. Uh, and at those, under those conditions, then finally also the CCU, the Consultative Committee for Units, recommends to the CIPM uh, that we should uh, redefine in 2018. Uh, and after that, there was a long discussion in the CIPM, uh, and the CIPM finally came to the same decision. So the CIPM uh, recommends to the CGPM, to the General Conference, which is taking place in 2018, that we should, should go ahead with redefinition. Yes, and by that, we then uh, have graved in stone the numbers, the numerical values of these defining constants, among them the fundamental constants of nature. So they are fixed forever, if you wish. There's no need to change them anymore. Uh, and this system now guarantees long time stability, realization everywhere, with ever increasing accuracy as technology proceeds, thus triggering innovation in science, industry, and technology. And this brings me to my outlook um, the whole system, as I said to you before, is now based on quantum properties of material. So it's sometimes also called a quantum SI. And as such, it is underpinning what is sometimes called the second quantum revolution. I showed you before, and this brings me to the last part of my talk, I showed you before that uh, metrology was the cradle of quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics is completely different from classical mechanics. And these are the key ingredients, the key elements. We have, in quantum mechanics, we have quantum statistics, which is different from classical statistics. We have the so-called superposition principle. So a particle could be in two states at the same time, which in a classical, it's either red or blue, a classical particle. It cannot be red and blue at the same time, but a quantum particle can. So a completely new property. Particles can be entangled, so they are knowing from each other. Um, and if you put them apart, even infinite distances, they still know about each other. If you measure here, you automatically project, as we say in quantum mechanics, the state here. So automatically, this, the properties of this one is also fixed. So they are entangled over very long distances. And Einstein once said, he never believed that really, actually. Uh, but we have all indication that it is exactly like that. And he said that this was a spooky interaction on the distance. So he never believed it. But it's true, as far as we know. Uh, and we have the tunneling effect, the so-called tunneling effect. If you have a 
classical situation, uh, you would only be able to go over a hill, uh, a rolling ball, for instance, if this ball has a, uh, enough kinetic energy to overcome the hill. A quantum particle can tunnel through the hill, even having not enough energy to go over the hill, so it can even tunnel through. Completely different uh, things. And this actually also triggered what sometimes now is called the first quantum uh, technologies. Uh, this entire semiconductor industry is based on these quantum properties. <laughs> all, your, all of your computers, lasers, LEDs, photovoltaics is based on that. A large part of medical um, devices like magnetic, ma magnetic resonance imaging is a quantum effect, a pure quantum effect. Uh, chemistry, you do quantum chemical calculations to calculate all your chemical properties. So all of that is based on uh, quantum effects, also biology. More and more we have biochemistry, biotechnology, and so on. Everything is based on quantum technology. So the first generation of quantum technology was, is now set um, to be put forward by understanding and exploiting the quantum nature of uh, our environment. And this, as I said before, accounts for about 60% of the world economy, and I've shown you some of the most prominent examples. Now, what is the second quantum revolution? The second quantum revolution is that we now, since about 20 years, and we are getting better and better, can have even control about single quantum particles. I've shown you before this single electron gun. So we can really have single electron currents, and we can control it. We can have single photons. And this is a measurement also which we did at the Metrology Institute uh, for the spectrum of single photons. We can know, exactly know, how many photons arrived at our detector and so on. We have single magnetic flow quanta, which are used in so-called squids, uh, quantum interference, uh, superconducting quantum interference devices to measure extremely small magnetic fields, like in your brain, for instance. Uh, we can control single atoms. So this is a fluorescence light of a single molecule, what you see here, which is changing its position a little bit, uh, as you can also see. We can control the properties of systems of electrons, phonons, photons, and atoms. So what you see here, also from a metrology institute, is a string of atoms in a trap. So you see single atoms here. And now we can address each single atom uh, and imprint a bit a qubit, a quantum bit in there, zero or one. And these quantum bits have completely different uh, properties. So we can build and, or dream in the moment still, build or build the first elements of a quantum computer. So the second generation of quantum technology is dealing with engineering single quanta and quantum systems. We are talking about quantum engineering. We can really engineer quantum systems, not only observe and use it, we can engineer, we can exploit it. And by that, we create the future. Uh, in the future, we'll probably have quantum electronics. We already have quantum sensors based a very ultimate, with ultimate precision. Uh, we already have quantum cryptography. So we can, um, we can create data transmission, which is ultimately secure uh, with quantum uh, cryptography. We can probably create quantum computers, and metrology is a very large part in that, as I'm going to show to you. So in order to exploit that all, uh, Europe has um, created a so-called flagship program, which is about 1 billion euro over the next uh, yeah, 10 years. And in part of this program is a lot of metrology and a lot of sensors, and I would like to show you some examples. Uh, for instance, uh, we are now building uh, clocks of the next generation, uh, which have an uncertainty in the order of a few times 10 to minus 18, relative uncertainty. Which means that uh, if you have a clock with a relative uncertainty of 1 times 10 to minus 18, if you lift it in the gravitational field of the Earth by one centimeter, this would go different, or the clock would go different by 1 times 10 to minus 18. So you have an extreme sensor, it's a clock, but it's so good that you have an extreme sensor via the uh, general relativity uh, of Einstein, an extreme sensor of height or of the gravitational potential of below you. And uh, this is very important. And, and here you can see then, this is the Earth in terms of, uh, of gravity, so to say. Uh, you can um, get a, a very, very sensitive uh, sensors for geodesy. Um, we would like to connect these clocks in the future. And we have had a first uh, project between 
France and Germany, where we connected two clocks in Paris and Braunschweig on the level of 10 to minus 17. And we are proposing to the EU to have a network of these, a fiber network over uh, Europe uh, to distribute with high precision frequencies time uh, to realize high-speed data transmission and also to realize quantum cryptography because these connections could also be a test bed uh, for future cryptography. Um, in the further future, you might even think that via, we can distribute this ultra-high precision via satellites and there's a first encouraging experiment coming from our Chinese colleagues, actually. They uh, finally succeeded in transmitting entangled photons. So these are these kind of photons where one or the other know each of the other one through a satellite to two different distant places on, on, the, on the Earth and measure there that these photons are still entangled even after this very long journey. And so this is uh, how technology will, uh, will proceed. Uh, presently, uh, at PDB, for instance, we have, uh, we have um, a project where we bring these optical frequency standards, which, as you can see here on the left-hand side, are very difficult. It's lab laboratory experiments, but we would like to bring them in a, in a small size, uh, in a box, so to say, uh, such that they can be sold uh, by, by industry and used by industry uh, on a push-button uh, yeah, level. I've shown to you that uh, these single electron sources might be uh, then finally the basis for a completely new kind of electronics, low noise electronics. Uh, we are fabricating this uh, quantum interference devices for little magnetic fields on a very small basis, very, uh, very um, on a nano basis, which may finally then you have a head, you set it on, onto your head and uh, they measure exactly your brain currents and maybe you can in the far future directly communicate with the computer through your head and your head <laughs> on top of it. Uh, we will have graphene-based quantum Hall effects and so on and so forth, and all of that will be empowered by the new system, by this quantum SI system. This is why, what we do it. And finally, um, you all know that we have uh, digitization all around us. So we, will, we are going into a digitized world, and the new SI and metrology will, in the future, ensure quality in this quantum space, in this digitized space, as uh, presently, actually, metrology also ensures quality in our present world. Thank you for your attention.